Hey, this is another of the Artists Make Change uh, conversations, our Ask the Artists series. Uh, we've been interested in hearing from different people and different perspectives on what it's like uh, at the moment in the UK to be an artist and what that has got to do with making change. So uh, our question answerer today is Labena Hamid. I'm going to pass over to Labena so that she can introduce herself and what she does. Okay, well, I talk about myself um, as an artist, um, so I guess I'm an artist. I make uh, paintings, um, I make installations, um, and yeah, a lot of drawings, and I was um, educated as a theatre designer, which sort of, mm, I guess that's sort of why the work looks how it looks, and it explains a lot of my attitude to it and a lot of my um, relationship with audiences. That's about, that'll, that'll do, I think, for now. Other things will come out, maybe. That's a great introduction, thank you. So we've got a whole load of different questions uh, we've been asking out on social media and other platforms to see what questions people have in mind. Yeah. And so we're gonna work through some of those today. Uh, in our interview. Glenn, do you want to start with the first question? I, I can definitely do that. So, question number one, Lavena, if you're ready. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've got, it, got all my notes and everything, I've got it. <laughs> Over a long uh, multi-generational career, you're well placed to assess the role of art in contemporary UK society. Uh, can art and artists affect or affect societal change? And if it can, in what ways? Well, I did, I did think about this, and yes, I, I should be able to answer this question. You're, I love the multi-generational, when, when you could have just used the word old. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> multi-generational, what the hell is that? Oh, I know. You've been at it this long, you must know the answer to this. Well, I don't really know the answer to this, but my answer to this is that it has to be a collaborative effort. You know, art on its own, there is no such thing as art on its own. Art is connected to museums, it's connect, connected to teachers, connected to librarians, it's connected to media, it's connected to broadcasters. You know, the only way we can affect change, the only way we ever have as artists managed to change or shift anything is, to, is by being in collaboration with these sets of people whose actual business it is, whose profession it is to activate different sorts of communications. So we are making things that, uh, that are intended to communicate, but these other professionals are, are taking this message out, taking these ideas out, brokering them, listening to audiences, making up their bits to add on to it with us. And that's the way that change happens. It's how do you have, how do we as artists have conversations with those sorts of people? And then how do those sorts of people come with us and we with them to talk to people who are curious and want to know or want to change? So I think that's the only way it can happen. The only way it does happen effectively. That's great. Thanks, Lavena. Um, okay. 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 We had a, we had a quick follow up to that, uh, and mm. um, th this is, I guess, um, in some ways, a simple question, but also quite a thorny one. Um, is only good art able to make change? And what is uh, good art? Well, yeah. What is good art is the first way to start. I, I think there is such a thing as good art. I think good art has a dynamism and an energy. Um, and which stays with you for a long time, long after you've experienced it. You, 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 can't, you don't always know why it stayed with you, or you, and you can never predict how it's going to stay with you. But there's a sort of dynamism in there, and it can be a, an installation, it can be a film, it can be a, a drawing. But it, there's a dynamism and an energy, a sort of tension, and that stays with you. Uh, and you don't necessarily know even when it's staying with you, how it's stayed with you, but that, that's what good art is. And 
I suppose, yeah, so yeah, only good art does have the ability to affect change. It, it, and unless audiences or, or people who have in, are engaging with this work feel the energy, feel the kind of tension and the dynamism in it, then there's no chance for it to help them make things different in the, in the separate and different ways that they make things different, you know. So yeah, uh, only good art can do it. And, and that's what I think good art is. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a really hard question, but I think you, you just know it when you experience it, you know. Yeah. Thanks. Rachel. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really a um, beautiful way of putting it as well. That sense of like, that the power or the connection in the art is the thing that's going to make change. And I yeah. guess in our next uh, kind of question, one of the things and one of the reasons uh, why Glenn and I were uh, talking to you today is that one uh, really large part of your work and your practice in life is also around activism. Um, and that shows through your painting, your artwork, your curatorial practice, your teaching practice, lo lots of areas of uh, research and activity. Um, so we have a question from Diana Alley, and she says, has winning the Turner Prize hindered or helped this activism work? Well, winning the Turner Prize put put me, it helped put my work in more people's lives. More people knew it existed than before I won the Turner Prize. I mean, you know, thousands and thousands more people knew what the work was, what I was trying to do, um, and, and had access to it in, in different sorts of ways. Um, so, so I guess it's helped. The, the short answer is that it's helped because the point about activism is that it's communicating with more people to have more voices in the discussion, more energy and strength in the, the way things are changed or decided. So it definitely helped, but it does mean, which is something that we kind of touched on earlier that I'm asked to talk about things more that I know nothing about you know so there's an expectation that I will that I can talk about uh, policy or you know government action and I, and, I, and I have no more I have lots of opinions but I have no more mm, I don't have a, a, a qualified strategy I just have the way I've always enacted my activism which is through my work mm -hmm. so it's helped in the, the audience for what i'm saying and what i what other people that i work with say is bigger but it means that sometimes people ask me i mean really to be on programs tv programs radio programs talking about things i know nothing about so i refuse to do that you know um so there's a kind of bit of a balance has to be met really and and did it um did that come out of the blue for you Lavena? were you was it something that you i mean i'm i guess you didn't covet it but uh, were you expecting the uh the nomination or the award well no there's two things there's two things i think in my life i've coveted it you know i understood it was important but i understood it was important not because it was you were winning a competition about who's the best artist, but important because it was a tool to get all kinds of different people, uh, but always, always curious, interested people, of course, talking about what contemporary art is. That was the that is the point of the Turner Prize. It has no other purpose whatsoever. It's just to to get that conversation into the everyday. So I did covet it, but then I I became fifty, and so I ne I just thought, oh well, I, I never won it. So I, I never thought about it in that way in relation to myself ever again. I, I thought about it, I looked at it, I, I went to the shows, I, you know, taught about it and talked about it. But once I reached 50, then, so then when 13 years later, they changed the rules, they sort of changed the rules one day 
And then I got a phone call almost the next day. So I didn't have any chance to kind of think, oh, I'm 63. They've changed the rules. You can be any age. I mean, I think if I thought about it at all, when I read or heard that they changed the age, I just thought, yeah, you know, that kind of 50 cutoff was a, was a weird thing, you know. Um, but I didn't really think... <laughs> extend the rules so much that somebody who'd been working so long um, w would be able to be up for it. It, it never, it, no, it didn't really, it didn't occur to me in that, in that window at all. Mm -hmm. Well, it was great. Um, and actually, I think uh, the next question, I think, um, runs really uh, nicely on from, uh, from that answer. Um, uh -huh. Dr. Laura Denning, um, she, uh, she wrote that she first came across your work via The Other Story, along the lines of Resistance, Black Markets, and other 80s exhibits, exhibitions in the North. And she says it's been a long journey um, and wants to know, have opportunities for Black artists shifted much in that 30 plus years? Well, I mean, it's two things, several things I want to say, really. Not all those shows were in the North. Um, but, uh, you know, some of them were, were London shows. But, um, yeah, of course, opportunities have increased hugely in that 30 years. Absolutely exponentially. However, I think they've increased at the very moment when the industry itself is on the verge of collapse. You know, um, not as much on the verge of collapse as the performing arts, but certainly the big free museums with the, with the collections that belong to us, um, to the places where anybody can walk in for free and, and look at any, you know, 500 years worth of art. Those places are really, really struggling. You know, and, and the tragedy would be that just as they manage to turn their policies around a little bit, they open up their thinking, they're happy to begin dialogues with a whole diverse range of artists, the, you know, the, the, the whole potential they have for being free, open spaces is on the brink of disaster. You know, it's absolutely heartbreaking, you know, that, that you would have a show, uh, Tate Britain uh, um, by uh, Lynette Yadomboake uh, opening uh, next month, and you'd have a show by Zaneli Moholy opening at Tate Modern um, in, in a, few, um, a few weeks or so, or quite soon, you know, these two really exceptional, extraordinary, totally different from each other, uh, black women artists who, who've, you know, forged a completely different path from each other, a completely different path from me, to have these massive important shows on at Tate, where, yeah, you have to pay to get into those shows, but, but still, and, and that should be the point at which there is such, it's so difficult to go and see them because people can't, unless they live in central London, they can't get to those shows, you know, or they're afraid or, you know, rightly, you know, to be, uh, to put themselves in danger, you know, in, in those kinds of environments. I mean, I, I think the advantage is, of course, if you, if you are healthy enough to be able to go, into those exhibitions, it is an incredibly safe environment because it's, they're great big, massive spaces with, you know, you're not going to get ill in those spaces, but people are afraid to go there. And the whole thing, you know, about, about con consuming or enabling people to, to engage with culture has suddenly become, there's a fear factor. There was already a fear factor for lots of people, which was real, but that could be worked with. And now there's a fear factor that nobody kind of knows how to deal with it or what to do, you know. So it's heartbreaking, really. The opportunities are massive, uh, really, really opened up, but the places are 
you know, just anxious about trying to keep themselves open and have the staff to, to, to communicate the ideas properly to, to whoever comes, you know, it's horrible, really horrible. But yeah, that, that's, my, that's my answer to that. Absolutely. And I hopefully those things, hopefully those um, decisions and policies and ideas around curatorial practice and focus are for the long term, not for the short term, you know, in that sense of these won't be the only shows. No, they, they, they no, I'm sure they won't be the only shows. I know many, many shows in the pipelines of these big uh, institutions way into the 24s and 25s. But audiences that that potentially you know were had had worries about going to museums because they thought oh, this place is not for us you know that that then takes lots of encouragement to get them to come back again and again you know or to come back in two years time you know it's just that there was some beautiful work done you know um, by the curators and by the artists, obviously, also, and by the institution with the uh, soul of a nation at, um, at Tate Modern. You know, the cues, the cues for those shows were cues like nobody had ever seen. Not the length of them, but the vibrant young black audiences that were really interested in this work. You know, and they, they found lots and lots of people found in those shows real resonances really interesting uh, subjects interesting ways of thinking that they hadn't necessarily seen in um, in art gallery in such an enormous way before and those things are still on offer in those big places but you you, you know it's like with everything you have to keep the momentum up you know um, and it, it would just be a pity if those audiences, you know, it took too much to get them back, you know. Absolutely, yeah. We'll see, but it, it feels like, oh, we were just on the brink of something there. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's a very hard time to be dealing with mm. lots yeah. of these different things as well, isn't it? Yeah, of course, and because there's so many other things that are incredibly immediate, you know, people's families yeah. and people's actual jobs, then those things are the bigger things of sort of cultural change happening in institutions that you thought would never, ever be able to take those things on. Seems like a small thing, but I think it's, I think it's a big thing, but it's yeah. hard to argue that along with actual people actually dying too soon. You know, it's yeah. impossible to have that in the same conversation, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess there's, there's um, a theme kind of here also that leads into Lorna Rose's question. Um, and what she's asking is, is there a role for curators in the diaspora in helping to shift institutional racial bias? in arts and cultural institutions. And I'm guessing she's, she's speaking here to the, maybe the African diaspora, potentially. Yeah, can you say that question again? I'm... Yeah, so is there a role for curators of the diaspora mm. in helping to shift institutional racial bias mm. in arts and cultural institutions? Well, there is a role, but goodness me, there's not many. Uh... Uh, curators from the black diaspora in those institutions and it absolutely shouldn't be only their job to make these shifts you know um, they hopefully and certainly the ones that I know are in these institutions because of their expertise in this period or that period or this kind of you know installation or contemporary performance or 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 painting, you know. So one would hope that they were in these institutions because of their art and curatorial expertise. There is a role for them to be shifting the policies, but there's a role for everyone in those institutions for shifting the policies, you know. It's, you, those curators need to be supported to be able to put on the shows, which might not be shows about black art at all, that's the other thing. Don't expect black curators to always make shows about black artists. 
it, it's a thing that sometimes some of us do, but, but actual, you know, if you actually want to counteract racism, then you have to allow um, people of color to be making whatever they want to make, whether it's the art that they want to make or the, or the shows and the projects that they want to make. And if that is working with um, people who are not like them, then that's a good thing. I mean, you know, ultimately that's a good thing. So I think curators from the black diaspora need to be supported in being able to be treated as equally as all the other curators. And of course, you know, being a curator sounds fabulous fun, especially in big institutions, but I think it's pretty hard work. You know, you're dealing with something as important and something you can really be passionate about, the making of, of work, uh, something as sort of intangible and sometimes impossible and sometimes super, super clever, that's the artist. And then you're dealing with an institution that moves at the pace of, you know, a, a battleship in, you know, World War One or something. And then you are at the same time having to try to think about funding. And then also actually at the center of all that is audience, you know, and I'm not trying to make a, a whole case for curators because I could argue with them also at great length but I do think it's quite a complex sort of multi-layered role that they have and um, trying to spin all those plates and do all that juggling and tapping the top of their head and rubbing their stomachs at the same time is it is challenging and then so I think that kind of neutral support system is what these institutions need at the heart of them for all their curators you know so i think they are becoming less hierarchical but they certainly in their past have been incredibly hierarchical institutions you know with the kind of you know the lowest of the low running around here and that's just curators you know so i think those things are they're beginning to sort of allow more voices to be heard and understand that support is necessary, care is necessary, you know. But yeah, uh, yeah, I think, that's the, I think that's the answer to that, that I have to that. Thanks, Lorena. And uh, actually, Rachel, do you want to take the next question too? Because I think that one was close to, uh, to your heart. Oh yeah, uh, this was a question that I wrote actually. Oh, okay. So I was think, thinking back to um, your series of paintings, The Guardian Archive, and then the residency that you did at the Guardian newspaper that followed that a few years later. Mm. And I'm interested in how um, during that residency, or I remember seeing like a bit of documentation or an article or something about how you were sharing your creative process and your observations and your modes of looking. And I think you're using the phrase like overlooking or overly looking. Um, with people who work in other disciplines, so it, in this example with journalists, to get them to think and reflect on um, or change things that they're doing. So I guess my question here is like, how does that, how does that work? Um, do people uh, see things differently after they're working alongside you or um, through the way that you can get them to look differently? Well, the thing is that I, I was talking about The Guardian, the pieces, you know, the, the whole archive from 2006 to 2016, um, was absolutely about how The Guardian depicted, represented, wrote about black people because of a MA project that I wrote in 1982, something like that, <laughs> um, that was dealing with the context within young black artists. How were we working then? You know, what world were we in? So, so I, I kind of thought about it then, but I didn't start this project till 2006 and I carried it on for 10 years. 
And it was specifically about that. So I would um, collected pages that had footballers, black footballers, you know, uh, racing drivers, politicians, criminals, everything, musicians, blah, 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 blah. So I have thousands and thousands because in 1980, uh, whatever it was, when I was doing my uh, MA, there was only one photograph of one black person for a whole year. So in The Guardian. So by the time it got to 2006, of course, that, that had massively, massively changed. But I was worried about it from for three or four years before, but I didn't really ever do anything about it, read the newspaper, threw it away, whatever. Um, then I started to collect these pages and, and paint over some of them and keep others unpainted. And, um, and when then what happened, and all the time I was showing this work and people were saying, oh, but have you spoken to The Guardian? And I said, well, yes, I've tried to, but nothing much is sort of coming back from them. And then people I know who knew journalists would talk to them and they wouldn't really have anything to say. Then I won the Turner Prize and there were these Guardian uh, images in the Turner Prize show. And um, the, the um, journalist who spoke to me at 8.30 in the morning after I won, wanted to have a bit of a Barney about this, a bit of an argument about this, um, and sort of couldn't understand what I was doing or why I'd done it or, or what on earth I meant. And so, you know, she didn't get it. You know, she said, well, I wish you'd come in and, and talk to us in the, you know, in the, us journalists and editor and all the rest of it. And I said, yeah, well, you can get me in there. I'll come and do it. And someone in Liverpool, um, great project in Liverpool, um, set up um, this project where they're looking at newspapers, looking at journalism, and put the two of us together, The Guardian and me. Um, so they had the balls to have me in there. So I worked closely, closely chaperoned in the offices without a desk, so I was on my feet all day, or, you know, for a week there. And I was collecting Guardians much after I closed the project, but I was collecting Guardians at the same time. I made this work and then I went in and did this presentation to the, to the journalists. And I, I made one at the beginning before I started and then another one at the end. And actually, no, it made no difference at all <laughs> because the Guardian writers were oh, oh, fantastically well-educated um, people. You know, they're, they're fantastically smart. And they, they just really more or less, certainly in that room, refused it. They said that I was, that my, my collecting was random and coincidental. So I named the, the, the completed piece at the end of that, random coincidence, because they, they just could not accept that the juxtapositions I was seeing were any more than, than accidental. And, you know, accidental maybe if I was doing it for a week, but not accidental when I collected these things over 10 years. You know, I did it in the most scientific way I could because I didn't believe it myself till I started to do it. It just seemed to be a feeling, you know. And that's well, okay, artists are allowed to have feelings, but sometimes if you want to make a point, you need to be a bit boringly and efficiently scientific. So, I, I had absolutely no effect whatsoever <laughs> because despite the fact they could see years and years of the archive, I brought lots of these pieces of paper along. They'd seen the paintings and the juxtapositions that I pointed out where you would have a huge picture of Bob Marley and, you know, their, uh, um, of them in front of um, a plaque where, there's a picture of them and, and a plaque, you know, where they were going to make the house where Bob Marley for the blue plaque or whatever, blah, blah, blah. So it was a nice little uh, piece, say, in the middle of the page. Uh, yeah, but a very positive piece. So oh, this is good, you know, recognised as cultural contributors, blah, 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 blah. But the headline of the page was all about ones with prisoners and about gang warfare. So that in your mind, when you're reading the newspaper, especially for reading it in that physical way, um, other things, one thing plays on the other. 
but they wouldn't accept that they don't that they do this every week and that they do it time after time after time. So I had no effect whatsoever. It was a completely no. People see it, <laughs> you know, and people who 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 think, ah, oh, I read that article, but I never noticed it, and then I can see it now. See it, but Guardian journalists—they're word people. They're not picture people. So they know they wrote the right thing. And I would never argue with that. That's why I'm so furious, because if we don't have the Guardian, what have we got? You know, I, I really feel that. But, but they, they're word people. And uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't compute that. You know, they couldn't do it. So I just, in the end, I just said, well, maybe what you could do is you write, and, and of course it goes at enormous speed. I learned a huge amount when I was there. That like the whole production of the newspaper, of course, is incredibly quick. I, I read it every day. I didn't ever think about them having to produce the thing every day. So they, of course, are producing it. And then, and then before they've almost finished producing it, they're writing the next article for the next day. So they're not looking at what they produced the day before because it's out there now. And so I, I asked some of them whether they would just occasionally look at the paper to see something that they had written the day before in the same way that you and I might look at it. And if they thought, well, that's a bit dodgy, they could just say back at, you know, base camp, this was a bit dodgy what you did there. It's okay, you know, but so you can't change it. It's not stopping the work. You still do what you want to do, but just occasionally take care of the, the baby that you produced, do you know what I mean? Just go back and, you know, see whether a conversation can be had. And that, that was as far as I could go. But you know something, you, you, you did ask me a question. I don't know whether it's gonna come in a different place, but there's a question about um, curators in there, which I think was, was one of those sort of follow on things. Um, you asked me, you, it was something about, um, how art institutions could ensure uh, inclusivity and diverse and represent uh, representational approach or you know to their activities was that conflated in with that last question not the guardian one but the one before yeah they were uh, they, they were uh, connected but we thought um, in terms of time we might uh, just choose okay. one but you're welcome to go for that one well, you don't ask me that one. Well, Rachel, can you remember it? I'm saying I'll find it. I'm gonna gonna just have a little search for it now. I I, I was um, ju just to make a follow up on the Guardian one though, uh, Bain, um, You know, it's so important, isn't it? Because so many people uh, see um, in black and white and with uh, and with the uh, the uh, photographs they see in in the media and they and people believe what they see without questioning it there's an authority behind there that is almost unquestioned and you know the real value of uh, of that uh, work that you did there was to question it and more i think more of us need to become better at questioning information that we receive rather than understanding it uh, immediately as fact or within our bubbles um mm -hmm. seeking out the the uh, the information that we believe or something yeah i think just the trouble is that you know the guardian is probably telling more truths than anyone you know so that's the kind of tragedy of it and i think that's why my relationship with them was really difficult because i was saying i you know i'm furious because you are the only paper that i've got please try and get it more right you know um but yeah you're right it's it was those sub, it was subliminal messages that were coming across too and and, a, and a kind of just a lack of care you know but you know newspapers are, are something that i i only read and now i don't read the um the paper version at all now so so the the in a way i had to wean myself off the obsession of collecting them so now i subscribe instead and just look at it online um and that's less anxious making in terms of the object um but yeah that that's the sort of problem i, I needed the paper that i think is the best to be better which is a lot to ask of the newspaper really. but, you know. 
find that question. Good, yeah, I found that question. Definitely. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, so the question here was, how best can arts institutions properly ensure an inclusive, diverse and representational approach to their activities? Well, I, I liked this question uh, and I thought, what those, the people in, in those institutions need to do, and you know, and I've just been very nice about curators, so you know, is ask questions. They need to ask more questions. They need to look at more work. And they're not really able to look at more work. They need to look at more work, not just look at the work that they've always been looking at. They need to talk to artists, talk, talk to us. You know, we, we some people do write, but mostly just talk, 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 you know, and, and artists are equally could do with talking to more people who have an overview of, of how things are made or how things were made or what ideas are floating around now that were floating around in 1912 or might be floating around in, you know, 2044. So, uh, and some more nurturing needs to go on. Yes, curatorial teams need to nurture each other. Artists need to nurture curators. Curators need to nurture artists. It's a kind of, you know, we could build something very strong here if we weren't engaged in this terrible pyramid thing. Um, I think certainly in the terms of regional galleries, they have to tell, they have to learn how to tell people who are not in the art gallery, they have to tell them what's happening. I don't know how many shows over the years, before I was a Turner Prize winner, I had in fabulous, beautiful regional galleries, and nobody ever told anyone this, these exhibitions were on. They just were on. And because these places were free and they were in the middle of small cities or big towns, they were just on and then they were off. But that communicating, that using the work to communicate with audiences, that encouraging audiences to have a sense of belonging of the place, people find incredibly difficult unless they've got 20 or 30,000 pound um, PR budgets, you know? So I really, really think that's important. And but the one thing you need to do, which actually is something that my cousin Richard Bliss said to me was, um, a genius at uh, understanding that audiences are not other. He said, invest in welcome signs. When you're in the theatre, you go into a theatre, you're welcomed in that theatre foyer, whatever, you know, old fashioned thing you like to call it. it you feel welcome. You know, people even say, oh, welcome, hello, would you like a programme? Would you like this, would you like that? In the art gallery, you've got these people standing there looking kind of looking too much like guards or looking too much like disaffected artists who wish they weren't standing there having to earn their living this way. <laughs> and, you know. But there is this, I mean, audiences are welcome in art galleries. I think it's a very old fashioned word and it's a very, you know, sort of, maybe it's a very cheesy word, but I think welcome, invest in welcome signs and a lot could change. COVID makes it slightly different, but still. Anyway, thank you, because I really, I really liked thinking about that question. Thanks, Lavaina. Um, we're going to um, maybe quickly change tack a little. Um, thinking about arts and education and um, a couple of questions coming up. But before we get there, we've had some questions in from some, uh, from some school kids. Uh, Knockall Primary School uh, Year 5 who've been doing a project on you and have asked some questions and then also Queen Mary's Grammar School in uh, Walsall and there's uh, two in particular maybe just to get us going so uh, from Knockall Primary School uh, they wanted to know how did you become an artist and maybe at the same time um, or to follow on from that um, from Queen Mary's Grammar School um, what was your most memorable art lesson or project that you completed in school okay. so how, how did you become an artist and what was the best most memorable lesson 
Well, how I became an artist is actually a bit boring, really. Um, my mother, um, who, who died recently, actually, um, was a textile designer. So she would go off to work at nine o'clock every morning for since I was a tiny baby and go to a studio uh, with lots of other textile designers and they would paint patterns all day and they would paint patterns in various colors you know so they had such and such paisley to do and they would do it in six colorways and then she would come home and and then she'd go back the next day and so for all my my life until she retired at 60 something that's that's what she was doing so i i absolutely understood that you could um be an artist and earn a living so that was kind of part of my that's i understood that Every Saturday, she would either take me to um, department stores and we'd look at um, clothes and curtains and ceramics and furniture and all that stuff. And just we were just looking at it because we, we didn't have very much money or anything. So we weren't buying stuff, but we were looking, looking, looking at it and feeling the cloth and, you know, just admiring how lovely things were and enjoying ourselves. And then on the uh, following weekend, we'd go to... Um, an art gallery, you know, the Tate, because there was only one Tate then, um, or, or we go to the v &A, and we'd be doing exactly the same thing, looking at things that we liked or things that we'd never seen before, or, and she would just be talking about them, not in a teachy sort of way, but just, oh, yes, yeah, so I think I could have done that, or, um, you know, all that stuff that people just say. Um, and so I became an artist because I understood that you could be an artist, that there, there was such a thing. My mother um, then, in a way, just encouraged me to look, to learn how to look without telling me that's what I was doing. And then uh, the, the honest, honest truth is I actually don't think I can do anything else. And so I went to art school to, uh, and I, I, I wanted to be a theatre designer. Uh, I was really interested in theatre, interested in how theatre, especially European theatre in the um, late uh, mid 70s, could be a very political thing. You could, uh, it was sort of the theatre of the chance encounter, if you like. So um, plays or performances that would happen in the open air, or would happen in markets, would happen in the street, would happen as part of other events. So I really wanted to be that kind of theatre designer. But then when I was at art school, I really, um, it wasn't, theatre wasn't quite like that, but I learned a lot of other things. I learned how to make things. I learned how to, I learned a lot about history, a lot about politics, a lot about the visuals, about clothes, about, um, again, about furniture, about interiors, about architecture, in the way that theatre designers do, you know, in order to sort of just cram all this visual information into your head. Um, and, and, and when I left, I, I sort of thought I might be a theatre designer in kind of fringe sort of way, which I did for a short, short while with um, quite very, very small theatre places. And, and then I became more interested in working to change how restaurants uh, functioned. It was about 1976, something like that. And um, the licensing laws were uh, different then. So uh, restaurants were sort of places where you only went for dinner. And uh, I worked with a man who was interested in opening them up in a more sort of continental way and they became brasseries. And I used the walls of those to put on exhibitions, making my own work, showing other people's work. And then I kind of just, it, all that then developed, all the things I do now developed out of that really. So that's the art, the art how did I become an artist? Um, early on and in all sorts of different ways. And what was the other question? Oh, the best project. Yeah, what was the best yeah, project? Yeah, well, what it was, was it was a theatre project. I had this great, great art teacher called Miss Runeberg, and she set the play Serrano de Bergerac. And it's a fabulous play about um, a man trying to... Uh, find a girlfriend and he he's very handsome but he's inarticulate and a bit like very very young men tend to be and so he gets this ugly old man to write fabulous poetry for him and so he can then 
woo this girl because he not only looks the part, but he sounds the part as well. And it was just a fantastic, it was a fantastic thing to do because I learned more about theatre, about how clothes could say things, how if you set a play in a particular period, how that said something. I needn't have gone to art school really, I should have just done that class and skipped the rest and just arrived to there. But anyway, that was the best project, it was absolutely brilliant. And, and that's a long time ago, We're talking 50 years ago. And do you, uh, do you feel the same amount of joy when you're teaching now? <laughs> no, no, I think I have felt the same kind of joy in the 30 years that I have been teaching. But now I, I think that, uh, I don't know, I've got, I think it's, I think there's a big gap now. Is it slightly too big a gap between the kind of way I work and the kind of really tedious discipline that I have, that I learned at art school, that I learned, you know, my mother, that doesn't fit very well with how uh, younger people um, want to work, you know? Uh, my working day is quite sort of rigid and, you know, it's long, but it's rigid and intense. And I, I think, I don't know. I, no, I, I think I, I am speaking the, some of the same language, but I don't think I'm really as good anymore. I, I don't think I can... Um, open up really new ways of thinking through my teaching. Uh, and hopefully I can open up new ways of thinking through the making, but I think my teaching is a bit disciplinarian for now, you know. <laughs> um, we did have another couple of questions uh, mm. on arts and education. I, I know we're getting towards the end of our, our hour um, so I don't know if you're happy to carry on with Aina or maybe we should... I'm ha happy to carry on and you can always chop bits okay. out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but I, 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 it's all gold, so it's going to be hard It's going to be hard to decide what goes and what stays. Well, just, well, just quickly maybe before we get to our final question then. Um, there's, um, there's a question about a perceived class gap in arts mm -hmm. and education. Um, uh, and maybe a, a wonder about how can the arts be better represented to and attractive for working class people? First of all, do you see a class gap? And if you do, then, you know, how, how, how are we going to uh, narrow that? For sure there's a class gap. And, and the only way to narrow it is to increase salaries. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of ludicrously simple. You know, you, you can't, you know, if you increase the salary, I mean, you know, it's easy to say, but that is the answer. You incre increase the salaries for either artists making things or curators running things, or then immediately people who, who, who don't have parents who can lend them money for a deposit on a flat or help them pay the rent, immediately then those people can think, oh, okay, I can live in a big city because let's face it, lots of big institutions certainly are in big cities. Places with lots of sort of buildings for studio space are in big-ish cities or in cities at least. But, but living in those cities is incredibly expensive. And so it's simple really. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming that the government knows that and that's why the salaries are so small. You know, how to keep a particular, and, and the point is that lots and lots of people working in the arts, of course, don't have any financial backing. L lots of those young, young curators or, or artists setting out don't have that. And it's a terrible, terrible struggle. So they're in there doing, trying to tip the balance it back in favor of actually the vast majority of the population but they're doing it on a pittance. It's all about paying people a, a proper wage to do a proper job. Being an artist is a proper job. Putting the art out there is a proper job. You know, 
I think that's so important and, and a question that we're probably not going to have time to get to talks about uh, this study that the Arts Council and AN did uh, back in 2016, which found that only 7% of artists earned £20,000 or more from their art practice in, in the 12 months previously, whilst 36% earn less than £1,000. I mean, there's no sense there that this is a profession or professional or that the, the, the activity is being valued as so. No, no I mean, it's not valued. I, I, you know, and I think that's sort of... I don't know. I think that's part of the problem. I, I, I don't know that the visual arts are quite valued as much as they could be in this country, but I think it's our duty as visual artists to be talking about what we do I and mean, actually what we do, what we actually do. This is, this is how I make a painting. This is how long it takes. This is how I make a film. This is who needs to collaborate with me in order to make it. Who, who, where do you ever see that? You know. So, so we would have a conversation like this, which I, I am enjoying having, but we could have been talking about the process of doing it. Then people who don't do it can see, oh yeah, that's quite a lot like mending a car, or that's quite a lot like fighting a law, a law case. There are problems to be solved. There are priorities, you know. So you, you, that I think there's a way that artists could be better at talking about what they do and not just thinking about themselves in all this. You need to be thinking about the longer term. How can we sustain this? industry well we can ex try to explain actually what it is we actually do and why well good uh, yeah i'm not entirely sure i can explain why <laughs> <laughs> no idea why i love the idea of advocacy though through explaining practice or through demystifying practice yeah. i think that's it's <laughs> such a key idea um, and yeah, one that I'm not seeing happen that regularly. I think it would be it would be really effective. Yeah, it would be interesting. At the very least, it would be interesting. You know. Yeah, so. really nice one. So I think we're kind of coming to our probably our last two questions. Okay. Um, so there's a question here that came from Lena Simic, and uh, it's one that she says she asks people a lot, mm -hmm. which is. What keeps you awake at night? What bothers you? Oh yeah, now you know, um, it's quite boring actually, what keeps me awake. Um, it's the sort of admin, the, the amount of admin that, that, that being a, a maker and a shower of things entails. It's a bit boring, that keeps me awake, you know. Uh, you know, that should I, I've thought of the answer to the question that somebody sent me an email about at four in the afternoon. It's just after midnight. Should I reply to it? Should I make a note about it in case they aren't, you know, read it at midnight? Because I don't really want to have the conversation at midnight. So that occupies my mind. Um, it's quite a lot of interviews and, and sort of uh, Zoom calls and board meetings and filming and recording in my week. That, that keeps me awake, worrying about, you know, how to, how to do that well, how to do it, um, how to do it properly. And I know I can do it, but it is fantastically time consuming. So it's, 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 that's what keeps me awake. What worries me is that time goes by very fast. When you're 66, it goes really fast. And, you know, I, I'm, there's a lot I need to get done. Sleeping is probably would be a good idea, of course. It would help. But, you know. I really empathise with the admin thing. I've, I've found that I've um, I've been not not so much dreaming about work, but actually working in my dream state. Oh. I, I'm, I'm waking up in the morning, realising that I've actually done a thing whilst I've been. Yeah. Uh, which is which can't, it can't be good. Helped. Can't be good. No. <laughs> Rachel, last question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're coming right to the very end. So this is a question that we're asking all of our interviewees in this uh, oh. series, which is, 
Um, what would your words of advice be for artists who are seeking to make change? Well, I wrote it down. I wrote, make art, make it often, and make it well. It, it must speak a truth for you. Don't waste time talking about politics unless you want to be a politician. So it's just making, 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 you know, because that's how you, that's how you have a conversation with yourself. That's how you can see whether the ideas that you're, that you have in mind that you think will make this shift, don't think it, make it. Because the thinking is in the making, you know, and you can't imagine it until it's made and then you look at it and, and you think, okay, if I came across this piece of work and I haven't made it, say, Fred Bloggs had made it. What, where's the tension? Where's the dynamism? Would, would that make me alter the way that I, that I do things? Even just a tiny, tiny bit. Because I think change is not this big thing that you do. It's, it's many of us doing tiny, tiny things. And, and what artists can do is make the work. Make it, make it, make it. And then, and then you, and the more you make, the more you can kind of think, well, no, that wasn't really quite as good as I thought it could be. So you put it to one side and then you're left with the things that do work. And then they're the strongest with the most diamonds. But if you only make one thing, then you have to go with what, that one thing. You have to show that one thing. But if you can try to make three things, then you can see that maybe one of them has it where the other two, hmm, you know, have some of it. So unfortunately it's about working. On the thing you know how to do, that you really feel you know how to do, that you can talk about, and that you can, you, you have the confidence to show, gives you confidence, gives other people confidence. You know. So yeah, that's the answer. It's that thing about, um, about success being 10% luck and 90% perspiration or something. There's, there's something you know, really important about working and working It out. is, it is, and, 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 and being an artist, is so much about being ready as well. You know. Ready for? The opportunities. If you're making and working all the time, opportunities come up and you're ready. It, it isn't that you're waiting, you know, hanging about, not doing very much in your studio and an opportunity comes up and you think, oh no, well, I, well, well I'm gonna have to think of an idea now. I'm gonna have to get some materials now. I'm gonna have to do some research now. No, you need to be doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, and then you use the opportunity that, that comes along, you know, they pop up, don't they? Whether they're kind of branchy type opportunities or people coming into your life, you know, musicians suddenly coming into your life or, or people who know about navigation maps or whatever coming into your life, you, you're ready to have a conversation. You, you're not there sort of waiting for something to happen. Yeah, don't wait for something to happen. Make it happen. Thanks, Lavena. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, really, I think really inspirational and, you know, a real joy to listen to. I think we got through half of our questions and we could have spoken yeah, for no, another hour or more, but, um, but I know there's going to be so much value in there. Rach? Yeah, just really lovely. Thank you so much, Labona. I think that I think that's give, that's going to give people lots of food for thoughts. Okay, good. And yeah, lots of insights and great great to hear your advice to everyone as well. <laughs> Can we ask what's next, Labona? What, what what are you up to next? Well, I've got to work on um, the Casablanca Biennale, which is coming up. It's been moved a few times, but I think we're going to. It could be May, but it could be September next year. So that's kind of a bit of a, we'll see what, what's happening there. It's definitely gonna happen, but you know. Um, and then um, I'm going to do a big uh, piece for the textile uh, biennial at, um, in East Lancashire, which will be in September 21. And then I have my solo show at Tate Modern which opens at the end of November 21. So I guess it's a good job they pushed, uh, you know, um, retirement age back. It sounds like you've never been busier. I've certainly never been busier. No, um, I've never been busier, but 
yeah, I probably should do less teaching, really. Oh, poor students. No, lucky students. Who <laughs> <laughs> knows, you know, what it's like now rather than, you know. Yeah, because the way I work is kind of slightly different now to lots of people. I just want to say real big thanks again. That was um, that was brilliant. Um, yeah, really lovely. Thanks. Really lovely. And hopefully the rest of your afternoon goes smooth and trouble free and, you know, all of these <laughs> things. <laughs> Yours too. Okay. Yeah, thank you.